Amen. Amen. Thank you, Karen. Um, is Karen the only one who has a friend like that? Yeah, I, I take it not. And um, yeah, would that, uh, that our times together like this um, would not only be edifying for us, but would also be equipping us um, to become people who, who can come alongside, you know, our friends who, who have these kind of thoughts about what Christians are like and um, can help them see something better. We're continuing the series we've been in, we're calling Building Blocks, um, some of the, the foundational convictions upon which we can really build our faith and build our lives. Uh, last week, the, the one we looked at is God is just like Jesus. And the one for this week is the one that um, the authors of the book, that was sort of the jumping off point of this for me, they, they call this, they say this is the first and the most foundational one. And the way they, um, well, the way they talk about it is this way. Their, their sentence is, God is love, so it's all about love. Um, and I don't know about you, but when I first, first read that, uh, my initial reaction was, ain't that a little overstated, <laughs> you know? I mean, doesn't the Bible also say God is holy, God is righteous, so isn't it all about righteousness and holiness? Um, I mean, first John says God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And he says you know, we, we must walk in the light as he is in the light. So isn't it about you know, God being light, which means you know, implies revelation and truthfulness and, and our walking in that? Um, you know, and, and the other question we might ask too is, you know, is an emphasis on love timely? Um, you know, th there are a number of, of prominent Christian voices in the United States today who would say that, that we are right now in this, this cultural moment that is just, it's, it's really intense, it's really bad. And so what Christians are most called to do right now is to stand up against evil. And, and again, if, if that's kind of where we're at, if we're, you know, we're here to stand up against evil, to emphasize stuff like, you know, God's love and, and that we're supposed to love one another and love our neighbor and love our enemy even. I mean, isn't that a little bit like a, a doctor saying, we really need to love cancer, you know? I'll tell you, though, the more I, I kind of live with this statement, <laughs> the more I think the authors are onto something and elevating love to be one of these, these really foundational axioms First of all, because of, of just how prolific we see this in the scriptures. And also because of people like Karen's friend. <laughs> right? I don't think people like Karen's friend are going to be, um, be persuaded or brought any nearer to the Lord through our arguing with them, through our telling them how wrong they are. <laughs> right? I mean, you get there. You got to get there. You got to get there and say, well, this is what we believe, and this is why this kind of conflicts with, you know, we've got to figure out how we love a person like that, right? But, but to love them would seem to be non negotiable, right? Not something that's only for a certain, certain season. This morning, I'm going to mainly focus on one passage, but I do want us to get a sense of the breadth of this, this emphasis on love that we see in the New Testament. So just, just a couple of passages here, just to kind of, kind of peruse. And this is just a representative sample here. Um, Galatians 5, 6. For in Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. And Paul is saying that to people who think that has a whole lot of value. That's really, really important. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Romans, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. And then it says all the commands summed up in love your neighbor as yourself. And then the, uh, the well-known love chapter, right? Uh, which basically has two parts to it in 1 Corinthians. The first part, it defines what love is. You know, love is patient, love is kind, love is not self-seeking and all the rest. But then the real crux of it is Paul's argument that, that actually this love thing is more important than wisdom then your spiritual gifts, which is the way you exercise your power in the world, that ain't how we usually think, is it? I mean, wisdom and power are how we get things done, right? But Paul says, no, there's something, something even more, more important than that. How about uh, James? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. And some words of Jesus, a new command I give you, love one another. So I've loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you're my disciples if you love one another. And then the great uh, commandments, right? The great commandment. <laughs> love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Love your neighbor as 
yourself. And again, these are just kind of representative samples here. So you know, in terms of breadth, I mean, this is all over the scriptures, right? It's all over the place. And just in terms of the weight of it too, just, just think about the language here. The only thing that counts, right? The greatest of these is love. The first and greatest commandments, okay? So it, it's hardly, we, we can't really say, you know, that, that this is some sort of fringe teaching in Scripture, right? Um, you know, it's, it's not. Nor do I think we can, can say that this is something only for a, you know, a more, more kind and genteel era than we find ourselves in. Um, you know, if you want to argue that today we live in an evil time, I won't argue with you, Okay. But I would ask that you might want to dig in a little bit and see what life was like when these passages were written in the Roman Empire, especially what it was like for Christians and for Jews. For the remainder of our time, though, I want to focus just on a single passage, not, not 1 Corinthians 13, but the other love chapter uh, that you probably don't think of that way. But actually, to me, this one, for my money, is, is an even, even richer, uh, more expansive chapter on the kind of love that the New Testament witnesses to. It's 1 John chapter 4, and here are the lines. Beginning of verse 7, listen to God's word. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence in the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and their sister. 14 verses, and by my count, 27 times you see this word love here. And, and for you uh, uh, Greek wordsmiths, uh, each time it is the word agape, which of the four uh, main words that get translated as love is the uniquely Christian one. It's not found in, in Greek literature outside of, of the New Testament. And sometimes this passage you heard, or you can see if you still have it in front of you, uh, it's, it's used in reference to God, his character, what he's like, what he's done. Sometimes it's used to people and how they're to respond you know, to God and his character and, and what he's done. And John says this elsewhere in the letter as well, but here it's just so, so front and center, isn't it, that, that, that love, in particular love for one's brothers and sisters in Christ, is the test, <laughs> It's the test of the, 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 the reality, the genuineness of a person's faith. And, and the reason for that is because love is at the heart of the very character of God. Twice he has this, uh, this, this phrase here that God is love. Now, that's something that, that Karen, I bet your friend knows is in the Bible. Right? People don't even know the Bible. No, it's in the Bible somewhere, right? They know that. And um, the, the problem is, though, I think that, especially for those who don't know the Bible well, but I think even sometimes for those of us who do, is that we, we, in the world at large, we hear so much more about love than we hear about God. And so I wonder if sometimes, maybe unconsciously, we, we sort of switch the subject and predicate there. And we kind of hear it as saying, you know, love is God. <laughs> And so whatever love is, well, that must be what God is. And, and that can be really dangerous, too, because, you know, when we think about whatever love is with all the message we hear about what love is in the world at large, well, that can lead us to think that, 
that love is and God is something really different from what, what the Bible says, right? But to say with John here that God is love does not mean, you know, whatever you think or I think love is, that must be what God is, is like. No, if God is the subject, then we need to let him define what love is, right? And he's very glad to do that. Even in this passage, we see, see some, some things about that, what he says love is. Uh, here's, here's some of it. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son to the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but he loved us and did what? Sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Another part that we read. We've seen, we testify, the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges Jesus is the son of God, God lives in them and they in God. So, so you'll notice that this call to love, it is not disconnected from the call to embrace you know, good theology, especially good orthodox theology about the person of Jesus, right? Now, last week, remember the axiom, God is just like Jesus? Well, well, here we see love defined as what God has shown us, what God has done in the person of Jesus. Now, what God has shown us in Jesus, we see that to say God is love is not to reduce God to some you know, abstract quality that you, you see on a Valentine's Day card, right? No, it's, um, you know, when, when John says God shows his love by sending his son to be an atoning sacrifice. I mean, that's defining, that's describing actions, isn't it? It's, it's a verb, right? Or is the title of a book that I have not yet read but need to read, uh, Love Does, right? Just, just think about, think about the, the, uh, the popular love languages book, right? There's, there's five of them that they name. Um, there's words of affirmation, physical affection, um, giving gifts, um, what are the other ones? Acts of service and words of affirmation, right? Oh, what's the one? Time, time quality time. That's right. That's the one I forget because that's the one my wife most wants. <laughs> it's, uh, yes, thank you. Um, but all of that, they're all things that we do, right? This is describing actions. And, and thinking about it, again, in terms of, of what God does in, in Jesus, you know, action words that, that might come to mind would be things like giving, serving, sacrificing, forgiving. Now, now, before we move too quickly, though, on to this call to love one another, I think it's really important that we, we just kind of get in our bones the source of this love in God himself, that this love that we're called to show others. You know, a long time ago, um, we lived in Southern California, and uh, we were part of this, or for a summer at least, I was an intern in this church, um, where they had a, a greeting time during the worship service. And the pastor is a very, really gregarious guy, and, and he wouldn't just say, you know, turn and pass the peace of Christ or uh, say hi to somebody near you. He would say, I want you to turn to two people and tell them, God loves you and so do I. <laughs> and you may think, well, I mean, Southern California, you know, these are kind of out there people anyway, right? Th this is Orange County, which is a really conservative area. I mean, at that time, at least, it was a whole lot of, uh, you know, like Midwest transplants there. And so, you know, the first Sunday I'm there, he says this, he says, tell the way God loves you, and so I, this, this guy in front of me who, um, you know, if I had to judge this by looking at him, I'd say he's probably like a, you know, maybe a, like a retired corn farmer from Iowa or something, right? Turns around to me, puts out his hand, looks at the floor, and says, God loves you, and so do I. God loves you, and so do I. You know? And I'm like, if I didn't already know a little something about what you know, God loves you means, what that's about, and, and the only impression I had was that it was something about you know, this guy looking at me or looking at the floor really and mumbling, you know, God loves you and so do I, with all the enthusiasm of like a, a turtle, um, you know, <laughs> that wouldn't do much for me, you know. But friends, when the Bible says that God loves you, it, it's a whole lot more than you know, somebody mumbling or even saying really enthusiastically, God loves you and so do I, you know? Now, God loves you means God sent his son into the world for you. You see, gave him to die for your sins so you could become part of his family as a daughter, as a son, you know? Um, if you've been in church much, I, I, you've, you've heard that, I think. I hope, hope you have at least. You know what? You need to hear it again and again and again. And again, often, let it really sink in that love is in the first place. It's not an obligation. It's not just something you got to do because God says to do it. It is that. But in the first place, it's, it's something that God has done for you, that he's shown himself to be toward you, right? And, and as we've, we've seen here, and you can see it all through the letter, 
John always connects this call to love with what we believe, what we profess concerning Jesus. So friends, know, believe, rejoice in, sing about, remind yourself again and again of Jesus, of who he is, of what he's done, because he is the objective basis for you to really deeply know how loved by God you are. Remind yourself of that every day. And you know what? If you do that, you will not need me or anybody else to say, oh, and by the way, you need to love one another too. <laughs> because, and, and, and I think John witnesses to it here in the line where he talks about the spirit coming to live within us. Because the more and more we get this deeply about God loving us, the more his character of, of love just, just kind of becomes part of our character too. And so it just kind of flows out of us. We can't help ourselves. But since John does make such a pretty big deal out of this loving one another thing, we, we probably ought to say a little something about that before we quit here. Now, the Bible says God so loved the world. So it doesn't mean we're supposed to love everybody, including, you know, our neighbor and our, our, uh, our enemy and, and the person who writes nasty stuff about Christians on Facebook and, and our other non-Christian friends. Yes, absolutely. But here... And frankly, most of the time in, in, in the New Testament, when we see this, this injunction to, to, to love, it's, it's to love one another. It's directed specifically toward our brothers and sisters in Christ in the church. That's what's meant by the one another or your brother or your sister here. Um, Gene Getz, a New Testament scholar, points out that in the New Testament letters, we see some form of this call to love one another about 50 times. And I really believe the reason for this, friends, is because churches are, are called to be laboratories, right? Where we practice what living out of God's kingdom values is about so that we can learn better how to live that in the world beyond the church too, right? And, um, and again, John is very clear, isn't he, that, that this really is the test. <laughs> it's the test of whether, whether our faith and our love for God is real. If we love one another. You know, when I was, um, I'm an only child, but uh, when I was a little kid, I had this, this series of, of imaginary friends and brothers, right? And they were great. They were. They, they liked pizza and mac and cheese and baseball and all the stuff I liked. They were great. They were really good listeners, really good conversation partners, you know. Um, it's really easy to love an imaginary friend or to love that brother of your dreams or to love the the husband or wife of your dreams, you know, love the neighborhood of your dreams, to love the church of your dreams, right? You know, the church of your dreams is full of brothers and sisters in Christ who are a lot like you and their opinions and their preferences. They're never in a bad mood, you know? It's easy to love that church of your dreams or that church you know, somewhere way far away that you heard about on a podcast is doing some really neat stuff, you know? Or that really cool church you visited when you were on vacation where, where you didn't stay long enough to see the flaws and the flawed people, right? But you know, friends, I, I am more and more convinced the longer I live that it is not just God's permissive will. That's his will where he kind of allows stuff, but, you know, what he wants it to happen, eh, we don't know. But it's not just his permissive will. I really believe it is God's intentional, active will that we get placed in families, and marriages, and neighborhoods, and churches that are less than ideal, right? Because that's kind of how we learn how to love in a more advanced way. My, my, my grandson, he thinks I'm an incredible basketball player. You're laughing. <laughs> He's seven years old, and he has seen me make three-pointers and all these trick shots and flying dunks on his six-and-a-half-foot hoop, <laughs> you know, which is fine when you're seven years old, right, to play at a, a hoop that small. But, but if you want to become a real basketball player, right, you, you can't just play against people half your size on a six-and-a-half-foot hoop, right? He's like, you know, you want to learn how to play the guitar. You, you, you got to hang around with some people and play with some people who know more than just, you know, you know, D-A-C chords, right? <laughs> you know? Well, if we're going to learn, friends, how to love in a more advanced way, it can't just be by hanging out with, you know, your dream neighborhood in heaven, right? I, I do hope, if East Main is your church, I hope there's some people here who, who you do kind of really click with, who like a lot of the same things that you like, who you find easy to love, 
I also hope, though, that there are at least a few of us that you can pick out and say, that person's really tough. They're kind of weird. They're kind of disagreeable. Because it's as we rub shoulders with some people like that that we sort of learn in a more advanced way what this love stuff is really about. So by the way, I think before you leave here today, you want to go up to the person that you find difficult and thank them and say, I thank you for being such a really difficult person for me to, <laughs> you know, actually don't do that. Don't, don't, don't do that. I, I did that in the first service and everybody came up to Bruce Smith after the service. Just no, no, no. <laughs> if you know Bruce, you know. <laughs> But think about it in terms of, of just, you know, one of the big ways God demonstrates love for us in Jesus, by forgiving our sins. Who needs forgiveness? Sinners do, right? Including people who sin against you. People who are rude. People who sometimes treat you badly, right? You know? <laughs> God is love, so it's all about love. And I hope it's been, I've been clear here that, that this does not exclude the call to holiness, to righteousness, to, to good theology, right? No, if love is, is who and what God is and is about, then the love we're talking about is not something vague and squishy. And if it's mostly demonstrated in the person of Jesus, what's the love? Jesus, what does he do? He confronts sin. He challenges us. You know, his, his love led him all the way to the cross for us. So, so this love thing is, is serious business, Right? Let me leave us with, you know, what last week we called uh, an experiment of trust. And, and this time, it's just a simple prayer that centers around, around this, this verse. It's an easy verse uh, to memorize. In fact, let me prove to you how easy it is to memorize. 1 John 4.19. What does it say? We love because he first loved us. See, you memorize it already. It's, a, it's an easy one. It's a good one uh, to memorize. And, and, and really kind of taking off on this verse, spend a little bit of time each day, where, where you ask yourself first this, say, you know, Lord, would you show me some ways that you've loved me? Show me what it means that, that, that you first loved me. Show me what it means in the scriptures, what you've done to show that. Show me what it means in, in the experience of my life. You know, has he, did he give you a good start by putting you in a, in a, in a loving family? And if it's, well, not really. <laughs> well, has he brought alongside you people in your life who've encouraged you? who've helped you along the way, who've helped you discover your gifts and, and learn what, what faith is about, you know? And um, has he provided for you materially, emotionally, other ways? And the second part of the prayer would be this. God, help me to be to somebody else something like what you have been to me, right? And then make a list of actually like two or three people, you know, for whom... You know, with God's help, you know, you're going to seek to be toward them something like what he's been uh, toward you. you know, giving, forgiving, serving, sacrificing, right? Remember, though, that's the second step. You've you got to really spend some good, good quality time uh, with, with the first one, you know, with soaking in the source, which is God and his his love for you, the God who reveals himself in Jesus, who, as this passage says, is the savior of the world, which includes you. The atoning sacrifice for sins, which includes your sins, right? And as we actually do this, friends, as we really lean into what, what it really means that, that God is love and he's loved us in these ways in the person of Jesus, we won't be able to help <laughs> but become more and more the kind of people who love others well too. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for all of your attributes. We thank you that you're all powerful. We thank you that you're all knowing. We thank you that you're more than amazing. We thank you that you're good. We thank you that you're holy and righteous. And we thank you, O oh God, that you love us and that you've shown that so supremely in the person of Jesus. And we ask that, that you'd help us to come to grips more and more and more with what that means, with the overwhelming amazingness of how loved we are by you in Christ. And then, Lord, just um, give us the wisdom and the willingness to live in response to that. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory. 
Amen.